I can't see that far. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Arya Thapa, and I'm Kevin B. Harrington Student Ambassador. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us to tonight's event. The Institute's mission is to engage, educate, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic politi and political life of their communities and strengthen our democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Before we begin this evening's program, I would like to remind everyone to please turn off their cell phones or other devices that may make noise. Tonight, Chairman Buckley, along with two other panelists, Michael King and Ned Holmes, will be joining us for the final part of our three-part New Hampshire primary stories. Following the panelists' remarks, we will have a brief question and answer period. Please wait until the student ambassador with the microphone reaches you before beginning your response or question. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our panelists. Well said. Great. Thank you all for coming. Um, for those of you who uh, have not been to the three, uh, two previous forums, uh, this is really about the 100th anniversary uh, of the uh, New Hampshire primary. Uh, and we thought that it would be a good idea uh, to get uh, folks that have been through multiple primaries, uh, both either as a state party chair uh, or as somebody who was very actively involved um, in, the, in the campaigns throughout the years. And so we want to thank you for coming, but most of all, thank the, the two former chairs. Um, I believe I met both of them in the same year. I think it would have been in either 1977 or 78, um, when you were working on Senator McIntyre's campaign, and when you were running for Congress. Uh, and you were in fourth grade at the time, mm -hmm. was it? Close. Yeah. <laughs> and working on Hugh Gallon's campaign. In 78, I was working on Hugh Gallon. Oh, it was Hugh Gallon. We all worked together back then. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Mike King was a state representative. Uh, I think his little bio is in the, in the prime, but a state representative for a long time. Uh, and he served as state party chair during the 1996 uh, re-election campaign. But you served as a senior staff person uh, in a number of presidential campaigns and have been involved uh, in them uh, over the decades as well. Um, in fact, we just had a mini reunion of the Dukakis campaign that, that, uh, that you came by here uh, in Manchester a week and a half ago. Um, and uh, for Ned, uh, Ned uh, really became first known as an aide to Senator McIntyre in the 1970s and then ran for Congress. And spent our um, Commissioner of Health and Human Services and ran, ran for Governor in, in 1992. Um, but has um, been extraordinarily successful uh, in becoming a, a very uh, important leader in the presidential campaigns. Very involved in the Gary Hart campaign in 1984, and, uh, and more recently, the co-chair of uh, President Obama's campaign uh, here in New Hampshire in, for 2008. So one of the things, while we do have a mixed crowd, uh, a lot of them are young people, uh, and uh, what we have done in the previous is talk a little bit about what your experiences are and why um, why you think it's important for young people to be involved in the presidential primary itself, not just in politics, but in the primary and what you think young people really get out of it. And since, Mike, you're younger than Ned, why don't we start, start with and I'll go way back to the 100th year. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, thank you, Raymond. Um, I was both, uh, I was state chair in the 90s, and, I, and uh, uh, I was political director for Howard Dean in New Hampshire. Uh, in, in 2004, and don't worry, I'll correct you. Yeah, mm -hmm. you should be well. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was pleased to have, but I have um, students from uh, from St. Aves to come down to our offices in Manchester and uh, volunteer and, and work, and, and I think they got um, tremendous uh, experience there. Of, live action of a uh, presidential primary campaign in the first of the nation uh, primary state. So, uh, um, and, you know, 
and it's nice that they're that they're here. Some are from New Hampshire, anyways, uh, but they weren't just people being you know, recruited in from you know, out of state. And, uh, felt that they had a little bond with uh, uh, New Hampshire, and I think it went to leave to to give them opportunities in uh, civic activities as well. It's a nice transition. Tell us about because you grew up in New Hampshire. Uh, Tell them, what was the first presidential primary that you were even just uh, engaged in, never mind involved in? What do you remember? Uh, just around the house was uh, John Kennedy and Adler Stevenson. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, probably the one I mostly tuned to was uh, 76 with uh, Jimmy Carter and Willie Gall. You supported Mo Udall. I did. Almost everybody in the Upper Valley did. But those of us who supported Jimmy Carter won. <laughs> I grew up in New Hanover. Now I'll be in Portsmouth for the last couple of decades. Then, um, when did you first come to New Hampshire? I came to New Hampshire. I uh, actually moved here uh, in 1970. So, yeah. so you were here for the famous Muskie. Uh, well, uh, interestingly enough, the first campaign I was involved in was on the Republican side. Mm -hmm. I had just come back from Vietnam, and I was coming over in 1971 to interview for a job in the state government. And as Sally and I were walking up and down Main Street in Concord for the first time, we saw this sign for Pete McCloskey, for the president. Pete McCloskey was a decorated Marine veteran from the Korean War and was a Republican. He's opposed to the war and he was running against Richard Nixon. I just come back um, a few months before and saw firsthand what happens when public policy goes very, very wrong indeed. So Sally and I, my wife and I, just walked in. And next thing you know, we're over in you know, the law office of Warren Reno next door talking to Bob Reno, who's a very well known Republican. He was the chair of the campaign. And before I went for my real job interview, Sally and I had both been offered jobs as field organizers for the McCloskey campaign. Um, I ended up getting a job that paid some extraordinary, I think it was darn near $8,000 a year for my first job. So since I made the big bucks in that interview, Sally actually went to work for the McCloskey campaign and was the associate field director. And you were talking about young people. There was actually a flyer that came out of that campaign. And it was a picture um, right across from the State House. It's a place called Pompano Sick Mills right now. If you go down underneath it, that's where the McCloskey headquarters were. And it's a picture of these young people kind of racing around a room. And it looks frenetic. People have got signs. They've got envelopes. They've got bumper stickers. They're doing this. And they sent it out to campuses around the country and said, join the peanut butter brigade and change the world. And what was fascinating to me in that campaign is seeing the young people who did come from all over the place, here in New Hampshire, but from all over. And, and that's always struck me as one of the things. So all my other primaries, this is my 11th go round. Please don't do the math um, on, on primaries. But what strikes me about the campaigns um, is the extraordinary role that young people play uh, in bringing energy and excitement and vigor and a sense of renewal. And, you know, back then when I was in my late 20s, that was very exciting. Now, some years later, it's still just as exciting because there is something so tremendously unique about the fact that if you want to, you can meet face to face in small group environments all the men and women who want to be the leader of the free world. And you have a unique opportunity to say, I'm going to work for that person. I'm going to dedicate myself to that person. And that, I think, is part of what makes New Hampshire so unique over these hundred years is we built the tradition. Um, but I think it's just an extraordinary way that we refresh our party by bringing folks in. They not only get to see the candidates, they get to see the active Democratic Party. <coughs> Many of them uh, who are not already, not already here get to see our beautiful state. And there's uh, lots of folks, I think, that continue to stay engaged in the public debate because their first experience is 
this does make a difference. I count, everybody counts. So both of you um, have touched on the fact that you uh, have uh, been key supporters in um, the presidential campaigns of the candidates uh, that were not establishment candidates and that they were uh, really the um, anti-establishment in the sense with uh, Dean, with, with John Kerry, and with uh, Gary Hart and Walter Mondale, and then uh, Barack Obama with Hillary Clinton. Um, since I've never been with uh, an anti-establishment candidate for president, I don't have any experience of, of what that's like. Um, but in the sense that since you don't have a lot of the party regulars, it really is fueled uh, by young people. Uh, and I know that you have both uh, supporting establishment candidates. I mean, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the difference of the feeling of, of the campaigns when you're with one that has all of the elected officials and then another that has just a lot of regular folks and a lot of young people. Well, I think it's evolved, uh, I think, for anti-establishment or a challenger to the party. Uh, in the past, uh, it's really taken a lot of, uh, what Ned was talking about, a lot of face-to-face -face contact and recruiting and, and then being able to talk to the uh, uh, candidates and uh, uh, you know, size them up. And then you know, if you get persuaded that you like the, the guy, you like the woman, you know, like what they stand for, then you, know, you get involved and, and, and it's a building process. I saw that change a little bit, I think, this year, uh, this, this go around, where uh, Bernie Sanders, as the non traditional candidate, uh, had such a you know, rapid takeoff with, uh, with, with these huge, huge rallies that he sort of got ahead of himself. Where in the past, you, you build you know, 20 people in a living room and, you know, and, and, and around the state, and I, I did that with Howard Dean. You know, Drove around in my car all over the state, and then you know he caught on, and there were bigger crowds. And, but with Bernie Sanders, Susler, he was such a phenomenon in the early to midsummer that he sort of jumped over that stuff. So there wasn't as much personal contact. And I think he's trying to uh, maybe try to get back to that, but it may be too late. You know, just because you know. He, where he shows up, just thousands of people show up. Um, so that's a little change in the last decade to uh, go the primary people. Well, and then my dad actually voted for um, Gary Hart in the 1984 primary, despite having a Mondale bumper sticker on his car. Um, <laughs> being Who put it? No, because he was uh, IBW, Union. Um, old Irish cranky guy, um, but the day of and the day before the primary of 1984 was a blizzard, uh, where depending on where you were in the state, 12 to 16 inches of snow came down, and uh, they were living in Rochester at the time, and two uh, young people came to their door, and they were canvassing and getting out the vote for Gary Hart, and uh, the way his story was is that they had hats on, but there was a lot of four inches of snow on top of that hat because they were not stopping because they were so dedicated and he was so blown away by the a politician could commit young people uh, to work that hard that that's what caused him to make sure he went out and voted for Gary Hart because he figured looking at his kids, um, he couldn't motivate any of us to help shovel a driveway so uh, Gary Hart obviously had something pretty impressive. Well, it was very interesting because I think the thing that any campaign, whether it's you're the favorite or you're the insurgent, um, what you've got to be able to do is to get your word out. I mean, if you don't have something to say, um, although this may be an exception on the Republican side this time, if you don't have something to say, no one will pay attention. But they seem to be doing quite well um, with, with the complete vacuum of ideas. That was a partisan comment. But, um, but you not only have to have something to say about who you are and why you should be the president, but you've got to have an organization that can move beyond speaking to a large group or speaking to a small living room full of folks. 
And right from the very beginning, the commonality that I saw in 84, um, Gary Hart's campaign, is they had an infrastructure that was, you know, it was, it was built one brick at a time, and we had folks all over the place who didn't have a lot of money. I remember a national press person coming in uh, to the headquarters in Concord and looking around, and he said, there's no signs, there's no bumper stickers. And I said, well, we're, we're getting those next week, uh, but we got plenty of position papers on, you know, the phone. And he said, you are you trying to tell me that somebody can win an election based on positions? And that was the same reporter, interestingly enough, who probably about two months later after Hart had won, was sort of saying, Gary who? We don't know anything about him. I guess because he hadn't read the position papers because bumper stickers are so much easier to get through. Um, but there was a really strong infrastructure there. There was in 08 with Barack Obama, but there was also a tremendous infrastructure there for Hillary Clinton. Those were two of, in, in my experience, the best organized campaigns that I've seen, and they were going head to head. And what was interesting to me is you've got to be able to keep that momentum going, but you've got to have the stuff that allows you to build it in the first place. But there is something kind of exciting about working for someone that you have to get used to the fact that if you don't have, you know, all the bright names and the elected officials on your side, you can't get caught in the trap of trying to catch up with running that race. Well, they've got 15 state reps, we've got to get 15. Now, the idea is you've got to get voters, you've got to get people who dedicate their time and have three inches of snow in their head on the day before the election to get out the vote. Uh, it takes a lot to do that. To follow up on uh, Raymond's comment about uh, the dedication of, of the uh, volunteers, uh, in the early stages of the Howard Dean campaign, I was doing hiring of initial staff positions. And some people came, you know, somebody set up a meeting for me to be another young man. And uh, who, uh, you know, so we went that after work. Uh, it just became, became apparent to me that, uh, uh, that the guy wanted just to get his ticket punched in a, in a, in a, a campaign, a presidential campaign, say, so, you know, I worked in a presidential campaign where I had all these other people like beating down my door just because they loved Howard Dean. And then those are the kind of people that, you know. And so I just, well, yeah, the other guy go on his way. Why should I, you know, hire somebody to won't walk through a brick wall for my guy? So Ned, what is your uh, best New Hampshire interaction with a presidential candidate story? Whether you're supportive of them or not, or is there <laughs> oh, something yeah. that you're like, well, that's what this is all about. I'll, I'll tell you two. One is about Mo Udall, and, and it was, uh, I was working with Tom McIntyre, who was a U.S. senator during the campaign. And this story has gone all over the place, but I just think it speaks to the, the primary itself. I wasn't there. Udall was going door to door, walking Main Street, I think it was in Conway, and walked into a barber shop. He said, hi, I'm Mo Udall, congressman from Arizona, I'm running for president. And the barber looks up and he goes, no kidding, we were just laughing about that. <laughs> and it is sort of the humbling experience of, you know, being a candidate running for president. Um, one of the things I remember, um, it goes back to the Hart campaign in 84. Hart had been a, a very prominent member of the um, Foreign Relations Armed Services Committee the Armed Services Committee, and had spent a lot of time, actually, and continued after his, uh, he left the Senate, to have a very strong relationship with Gorbachev in, in Russia and a lot of the emerging leaders in, in the, uh, on what was then called the Pacific Rim. But sitting in my living room with probably 14 people who'd come over to listen to Gary Hart talk, and he's having this conversation about conversations he's had with Gorbachev and talking about 
the intricacies of foreign policies, the type of stuff that I am sure would, you know, bore the hell out of a huge rally, and you'd never get a follow-up question if you were on a typical talk show this, these days, because they're looking for you to pick a fight with someone. But the very notion that he would be talking in such a serious manner about such an important thing with a group of folks, and that same thing happened in my living room and other living rooms with Al Gore and with Mike Dukakis and with a host of other people. And you say to yourself, what makes the New Hampshire primary unique? That gets replicated literally hundreds and thousands of times. And, and people don't get away with sort of, at least I've not seen them get away in the Democratic Party in, in our primaries with just doing the glib talking points and moving through it. They're going to be serious questions. Um, the one thing I'll also share is it was, it was interesting. I wasn't there. It was uh, back in 08 and Obama was in the car and the staff person was with him handing him his cards about the next phone call he was going to make. And he got the next card and it was with a person who had some real interested interest in domestic violence. And it so happened that Obama had met with that person three times. There were follow-up questions. It, it, this was literally probably the sixth interaction of clarification of this. And he held the card and looked at it and he said, this, this is the person I've talked to six or seven times. He said, yeah, but you've got to call back. Because it was that one follow-up question. So he puts it down and dials the phone. And before he hits the last number, he said, this is indeed a humbling experience. <laughs> and it's the next got on the phone. He got the endorsement. But it is a humbling experience, but an extraordinary one. There's a, uh, you know, an expression that, that when they ask who you're supporting, you say, well, you know, I've only met him once, you know, or it takes <laughs> three to five times to, to decide who you're going to you know, vote for. So it is it's, uh, another, another humbling experience. I supported Bob Carey when he was running and uh, he had an expression, he said, you know, New Hampshire, you know, you meet them all and, you know, they expect you to take your, your, your garbage out. <laughs> you know, you just do anything to expect anything. Um, I thought uh, last couple times we've actually run out of time because people had questions and stuff like that, so I don't know. You want to um, start with having questions, then they can kind of fill in with uh, answers. Um, does anyone like to ask either uh, Ned or Mike a question about the past campaign or the current campaign, uh, or they're involved? They were involved, obviously, in more than just presidential campaigns as well. curious about why you think um, people in New Hampshire are enamored with Trump and with Carson. I, I don't understand because I tend to think people in New Hampshire are smarter than that. But I could be wrong. Well, yes, we am. Well, we're not the best three people to analyze that, <laughs> but uh, uh, there's, uh, you got to look at sort of the demographics, you know, there's the Republicans and then the, 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 the Trump Republicans. I mean, so it's not, he even says, you know, it's, he's at 25% or whatever he's at, it's not 25% of the entire registered voters. You know, so it's, but it is, it, it, I think it's an odd year and people are ticked off and they want I think Carl Rove mentioned it on Meet the Press this last, last night, um, where they say that they always want the opposite of what they've got. Uh, so each election cycle is close to the opposite. And if you think of Barack Obama as um, a constitutional uh, law professor, uh, as somebody who was you know, very you know, Harvard educated, uh, extremely um, serious, a fault, uh, and uh, that the flip side would be Donald J. Trump. 
I think, too, uh, one of the things that has evolved in a way that I'm not at all sure is very positive is the 24-7 news cycle and the type of stuff that can get attention and keep the attention of people. I am convinced that most of the 24-7 cable news, whether it's left or right, have a major objective. And that is to make sure that you go to bed at night feeling worse about yourself, your country, and the world than you woke great job up that morning. Um, and it, it, it fans the flames, it fans rhetoric, it makes for good back and forth TV. Um, but I, I think back to, boy, am I going to sound old. You, you think back to guys like David Broder and Johnny Apple and some of the real lions of the press in the past. And, you know, I, I just sort of had a, you know, some of the stuff that's been said in the past, uh, 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 you know, something that's just completely made up, but, uh, uh, spoken as if it's true. You know, I think back to the day when Walter Cronkite might have been on the evening news and just looked into the camera and said, that's foolish, and it's the last time we're going to talk about it. And it would have been over. But now we sort of say, well, there's the opinion that since he can make a snowball in his backyard, there's no such thing as climate change. For the counterpoint to that, as if there's a counterpoint to idiocy, mm -hmm. you know, I, as if somehow that senator who chairs an important committee on climate change says out loud, there's no climate change because I made a snowball. And that passes for commentary and, and is treated as if, well, there's one side of the story, now let's get the other. And I think that that has really had a, a, a big influence on taking somebody like, you know, the, the two folks that you mentioned. And as Mike said, you know, Trump has 25% of a party that has about 30% of the electorate. So that's down to about 11 or 12% of the voters. Um, but still it dominates 80% of the coverage. And so I think we sometimes get an inflated picture of, of um, just how delusional folks are. I, I, I think you can't avoid what probably pretty much everybody here realizes that there's a real disgust with Washington, too, and that, I think that feeds, that feeds into it. You know, it's a pox on all those people, or this guy Trump, or Carson, you know, or the <laughs> extreme outsiders. I think it's important to, to remember that Pat Buchanan did win the New Hampshire public primary. Uh, in 1996, and he came very close in 92 to beating uh, President Bush. So it's not a complete anomaly. Uh, it's, it's an anomaly in the sense of it's not what we think of of New Hampshire uh, or, and the primaries, uh, but it is, it's not something that is totally out of uh, the realm. Uh, one looks at Iowa when um, Pat Robinson came in uh, number one uh, in 1980 in Iowa. Uh, against the sitting vice president, the Senate majority leader, uh, a long list of other very distinguished people. And this is the guy that every time there's an earthquake, so it's because gays exist on earth. Uh, and he won the Iowa caucus. So you also you mentioned the importance of young people on um, presidential campaigns, and one thing that's very prominent with young people nowadays is social media. What are your thoughts on how that is impacting the New Hampshire primary? Well, I'm I'm having great fun on uh, Twitter. Probably way too much fun than my staff wants me to have, um, but uh, I'm on it 24/7. Uh, you know, like 68,000 times. Um, so don't follow me if you don't want to be a really informed person. Um, but uh, you know, trying to keep up with Facebook and and, uh, uh, and Twitter for someone my age, uh, and that's only two of the probably two dozen that all of the young people are. Well, I I can't 
conflict. When somebody says, oh, you should do this, you should do that, I can barely handle Twitter and Facebook. And you guys, I, I do have an Instagram account, but I don't post anything on it. I just kind of am the recipient of information. Uh, but there's so many more, and every day I'm being told by my staff that, oh, that's so two years ago. I was like, I didn't even, I just heard about it, and it's already out. Um, but uh, what the beauty of that is, um, in, the, in the bad part, the beauty is, is that you can get information out very quickly to a lot of people. Uh, so as somebody who was a staff person, uh, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the early 80s, before there was even a fax machine, never mind internet, and to get a press release out of New Hampshire, you actually had to mimeograph the press release, or the press person would, you'd get in the car and you'd drive from radio station to radio station and put it in an envelope and put it in the door slot uh, all night long, and hoping that somebody would open it in the morning and read it in the morning news. Uh, now, you just the problem with that is it's, it's completely uh, unregulated in the sense that anyone can say anything, and so and they, they can be untweeted, uh, can be can be retweeted uh, hundreds of times, and it can be a complete lie. Uh, versus before there was a, a filter, and there's no filter uh, for there's no little check mark of like well actually this is true or oh no this person's just being snarky uh, or just being mean, uh, and that that's the real challenge of trying to uh, get people to be able to figure out who is somebody you can trust uh, when they're getting sort of unfiltered information. It's, it's really had an impact. I, I was just looking over some old notes uh, back when I was chair in 92. And the, the election came down really to, to, to Clinton, Songus, and Jerry Brown. And one of the things that Jerry Brown did at that time was he was one of the first guys to come up with a, a national 1-800 number to solicit contributions. And it kept the money flowing in like crazy. And so Do you even know what a one eight hundred number is? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you take the dial. And, <laughs> um, oh, that was attached to the wall. <laughs> but I, you do that, and then Howard Dean came along and really revolutionized it. I, I, I just think, you know, just as, as, as Sanders is sort of having the big extravaganzas these days. Dean started very, very differently. It was the network and the connections and all of the stuff that he did that was amazing. And I remember in 2007 going to the first meeting that we had when our full campaign staff for, um, for Obama was in place. And, um, you know, David Axelrod and Clough were there and they introduced all the staff here in the state. And I was doing well. Here's the political director. I know what the political director is. Here's the field director for the public. I know what that is. Here's our media person. And then they introduced the person who's in charge of new media. And I looked over at some of the other folks in the room that are about my age, and Paul McEachern had a big frown on his face with the social media woman. So um, I don't know if it's a, a benefit of old age, but you, you get to ask questions and aren't afraid if you're going to embarrass yourself. And I said, could you explain what that is? And I think in 07 and 08, um, they had learned an awful lot about what had gone on in the Dean campaign, and they had a tremendously effective social media campaign that I think really, when you looked at it, was able to reach out and connect with young voters. And then in 2012, I was once again blown away because um, the way they connected with people is they would connect with those people, not just about the campaign itself, but they connect with people about things that that person cared about. And if there was a person in neighborhood A on the west side of Manchester who cared about the environment, they would link them up with another person who lived two blocks away who was just as passionate, who was already in the campaign. And doing that uh, through social media as well as other connections um, the downside is what Randy just pointed out. Uh, there is no filter. Um, and so stuff becomes substance without, you know, any real test of the validity. Yeah, like the latest with the, the Muslims celebrating in uh, Jersey City, uh, oh. that nobody can, it seemed that uh, nobody could find the tape of, of the report or something like that. But Trump insists, you know, because he got some tweets of people that said, oh yeah, I saw that too. Whether you get the tweets or not, he 
people uses that as his data for saying, I must be right. He does have a marvelous memory. The greatest, I believe he said. I heard he had the greatest memory. The greatest memory, that's yeah. what he said. Previously, are the stories or the influences of the spouses of the candidates or the families of the candidates? And I wondered if either of you had any particular stories to share about the family members of the candidates and how that affected the campaign. I'll give you two quick ones. Um, back in the day, um, the Gary Hart campaign, Hartley would spend nights at our house. You know, he'd come one or ten o'clock for the guest room. And his wife actually spent some time. His daughter was with the, lived with us for about a month. And um, Lee Hart, Gary's wife, was in our dining room on the phone, working the phones. And so she's calling. I can't remember where she was calling, but she gets on and she said, "Is this so and so?" And it wasn't so and so. And she said, "Oh, it must be a wrong number." Well, that really doesn't matter. I'm Lee Hart, and I'd like to talk to you. And by the time she got off the phone, she got a committed voter. <laughs> um, and I think uh, people were, they had been separated previously, and so, you know, there's all, all of that baggage. Um, but Lee was able to connect with people. Um, I mean, she was just a killer at the uh, senior center. She could line dance like nobody's business. And man, she just, she'd be in there line dancing and doing all this stuff. Um, Michelle Obama was was also an extraordinary asset um, to, to Barack. It, it, um, it, he, she actually did her first house party at, at our house up in Concord, and there were about you know 100 or so people there, and jammed in in a big house. But uh, I remember somebody going up to her afterwards and said, "If a woman like you loves Barack Obama, he must be good enough to be president." If, if you are impressed by him. Um, she was tremendously effective, I think, and was a counter to one of the things that Raymond said a little earlier. I mean, uh, Obama is a professor. He's a constitutional law professor. He's serious as the day is long. And Lee is, I mean, excuse me, and Michelle is serious, but she's got such a manner with people and was such an extraordinary asset as she could go around. Um, and I think also, um, it just having that voice and that leavening is, is so tremendously important. And I think you see that in, in many, many of the candidates that, uh, that run and, and, the, and the role they play. Is, you know, I've said before, um, you know, in a race, uh, you know, there's, there's only one name on the ballot, but there's really at least two hearts in the race. It's, it's the candidate and the spouse. Um, you, you cannot uh, run for office if you're in a relationship with someone who is special to you without that being just inextricably bound together in one way or another. And there's the private support that the spouse provides to the other person, but also in many cases there's the public support which gives you a picture of not just the person who's going to be in the White House, but the environment that that person is going to be living in kind of influences that would be the first voice they hear in the morning and the last one they hear in the morning. Now, Mike, I had a much different experience. Right. You know. Probably the most historic difference uh, on, on either side because um, you know, Howard Dean's wife is a practicing physician and, and continued uh, her practice. Mm -hmm. And raising the kids up in Burlington. And, yep. uh, uh, but they were, so her presence wasn't there, but they, they were still connected. I mean, I'd be many nights I'd be with them. I gotta call Judy, you know, and you want me to leave? No, no, no. Uh, it would just be a family phone call, you know, and it was, uh, you know, so she was supportive that way. I, mean, I think she was a little hesitant, just didn't get out in the public as well and respected that. You know. So but it was, I wouldn't say it was a handicap, it was just something.
Oh, I wonder if you had any uh, horror stories about campaigns or events gone wrong. What that was like. Horror stories. <laughs> we don't have enough time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, horror stories. Oh, God. I did, uh, Sue Casey, who, along with Jeannie, she about her book. I'm yeah. going to bring that up later. Yeah. I, I'll just sort of put my little ad, ad and then I'm going to have it then. Um, lots of times, uh, young people ask me, like, what's the one book to read about the New Hampshire primary that you really, really captures the primary? It's an easy read, and you really feel like when you put the last, you know, close to the cover from the last page, that you've walked away with something. And it's really the book about the 1984 Heart campaign. It's called um, Heart and Soul. Uh, and I would encourage you to go on Amazon and get that. If you, it doesn't matter if Democrat or Republican. Uh, it really is something that really told the real story of, of what it's like uh, to be in the New Hampshire campaign with some very valuable lessons in it. Sorry. And yeah, maybe the librarian too. <laughs> you know, actually, Jeannie Shaheen, who's many of these pictures, and Sue Casey um, actually ran the Hart campaign back in. in uh, 2000. No, 1983. Mm -hmm. Yeah, many, many years ago. Um, <laughs> but they ran the campaign, and there's a couple folks over in the picture over there. Danny Calgary was sitting with Gary Hart. I think that's probably the Merrimack restaurant. Unless I missed my guess. But Dan Caligari was on the staff at the time. Will Cantaris was supportive, and they just tell a story of they had to get Hart from place A to place B in the Upper Valley. And um, they all piled into the car they were running behind, took off like a rocket, and then realized there wasn't a person in the car that knew where the hell they only dressed for us <laughs> to get to the place. And so they're driving around asking for, I mean, it just, Chaos. You just are completely lost. The one that always catches my mind. I I went up and saw um, one of the debates up in uh, at, at Dartmouth, and um, the first one I went to was Hart debated, um, and uh, he actually did a very very good job in the debate. And I thought my campaign. Had that campaign had reached its pinnacle the next morning when everybody on the Today Show said they clearly hard had won. I said, well, chief, you know, here's the underdog, and at least he's won a debate. But half an hour before it, I was supposed to stand out in front of Ann over in. He was place A. He was going to come over. I was going to introduce him. There was a bunch of students there. They were going to roar their approval, pump him all up, and he was going to go and slay the dragon inside. Um, well, that all works out fairly well. There weren't cell phones. Where's Hart? Who knows where Hart is? When's he going to get here? Nobody knows when he's going to get here. There's a group of people. What time does the debate begin? But it's those kind of things, and you see how it's coordinated and choreographed now. But there are just moments when uh, it seems very much out of control. But I mean, that's part of the fun of it all. Part of the fun of it all. I'll give you one more quickly. You never made the light of day. In, in the race, um, Birch By, Fred Harris, Mo Udall, all the, they were debating over at Manchester Memorial High School. And Fred Harris was a very big progressive for Iowa. And his issue was, he would say, the issue is privilege. Much like Sanders talking about the 1% and the 99%. But that was his issue. And he said it all the time. You know, it was his signature line. And so I was in the band room with all the other candidates, and they're waiting for, the, for Harris to show up. And so Birch By is sitting over there, and he's got the symbols, and he's just toying around with the symbols. And he says, he yells across the room to you, he goes, Mo. When Fred comes in, you yell, the issue is privilege, and I'll wham these things together. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I mean, it's just, in moments like that, you realize that uh, with everything that's going on, they can still be fairly funny. <laughs> These too. Wasn't 
prepared for this question, but I, I can think of one time I spent a long day with a, with a candidate and um, we had a meeting with a uh, prominent leader of, 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 of the mill trade union, which was all the unions down at the, at the shipyard. And so the, there was a speech and then we pulled off in this side room and uh, it was give and take. We were looking for an endorsement from, from the union. And uh, the candidate kept <laughs> nodding off during the conversation. <laughs> and what can you do? You know, you know, I mean, you just, uh, <laughs> that was embarrassing. One of the thought of in, in 84, um, somebody had to drive the party around to a bunch of events, a bunch of house parties. And so we got this person who will remain nameless, uh, who was on, uh, on the steering committee um, to drive them around. And um, Hart came back at the end of the day and said, can you tell me any particular reason why you chose individual A? And we said, was there a problem? And it turned out that at every single event, individual A who was the driver, when Hart would say, does anyone have any questions? Would ask him a question about some abstruse economic policy <laughs> or some ridiculously, you know, you know, there's there's parts of the tax code, um, I'm thinking particularly of subsection eight, you know, those kind of questions. And he said, any particular reason why you had him drive me? And we had to explain to him that there was a reason. He was the only guy on the steering committee had an American car. <laughs> he wasn't showing up in a Volvo or a <laughs> This is not unusual because in 07 <laughs> there was a supporter um, who's still involved who had contacted me and said, sure, uh, you know, if you need a driver, I'll drive the candidates. And, and he, then each time they'd like, okay, he can't ever drive. And I'm thinking, Whatever, okay. And after like the fourth one, I thought, well, what? apparently he just never shut up for a second. The guy, the candidate for president, got in the car and talked nonstop until the door opened. And then soon he got it. They never could do a phone call, could never do anything else going on because he saw it as his opportunity to have an entire day uh, with the candidate for president. <laughs> I saw him bicycling by the office the other day. He doesn't get to drive. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering what you think the chances are of getting so much money out of politics. Well, uh, let me just jump in first because it's what gets me so jazzed up and then they can come in with more serious stuff. Um, absolutely think this is the United decision was probably uh, one of the most destructive things that's happened in my life. Um, and the, uh, fundamentally what it does is, uh, and when it came down, I actually said, I'm glad I'm not a young person, because I think that I would not have, uh, thinking of what that has the potential of doing would have deterred me from wanting to be involved. So that's why I'm so proud that you are all so involved, because you do have something out there that just simply didn't exist before that Supreme Court decision is, is a corporation can uh, say, okay, Senator X is voting against our interests because they want to put environmental controls and we want to pollute. And so you go find some good looking person who can debate, uh, but doesn't have a, a, a dollar in their pocket, and doesn't really want to do any fundraising, and say, okay, you go file for US Senate. We're going to spend $30 million to get you elected. You don't have to do anything. So when you get there, make sure we get to pollute. <laughs> And, and that's legal in America today. And uh, you can take any issue and create that. It's very overwhelming. Uh, it's very overwhelming in the sense, when we, were talk, we talked about 1978, I believe that um, Tom McIntyre's re-election campaign was about $130,000 mm -hmm. in 1978. I was 18 years old. Not that much younger than some of you are about the same age. I could perceive myself as maybe at coming from a poor family, being able to run for the United States Senate if I thought I had a message. and How a uh, 
a young person without any sort of connections can envision themselves running uh, in this world without selling their soul to some corporation. Uh, it's very difficult when uh, the Shaheen uh, Senate okay, is taking Brown out completely. I'm just talking about Gene Shaheen's effort, whether it's what was her campaign spent, the party spent on her behalf, or the special interest, um, was almost $30 million. So in my lifetime, we went from $130,000 to nearly $30 million in Little New Hampshire. Uh, the same is the way with the presidential campaigns. Barack Obama's re-election campaign in 2012 in New Hampshire. Obviously, I'm glad that it happened. It makes a profound difference for our entire ticket. But they spent $20 million on television in New Hampshire alone. Uh, and this is happening on both sides. It, 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 it is um, until we can overturn this in United Anything else is a moot point, in my opinion. And God love all the people that are out there talking about campaign finance reform. But you cannot contain it as long as there can be unlimited co corporate contributions or expenditures on, on the other side. That you can talk about trying to do this, do that, but you're, you're, you're you know, painting around the margins of, of, of the issue. Uh, that, and what it's going to have to take is that the American people, and, and Certainly, these young people have to really take this as, as a mission because it, we can affect change if people understand that all it takes is getting the U.S. Senate, getting Congress, and, and uh, three quarters of the state legislatures to overturn that decision or change the membership of the Supreme Court. But it's the fundamental, in my opinion, uh, and I know I don't want to sound like one particular presidential candidate, but it, it affects every single other issue. Uh, and it can become very overwhelming. We can't allow it to become overwhelming because I think that was part of the point, uh, is that because when we give up, we, we give our power even more uh, to the, to the uh, special interests. It's something that we all need to take very seriously to be involved. Sorry. Yeah, I, I can't expand too much on that other than that uh, I, I agree that it's, it's just a terrible situation. But when you say get money out of, of politics, I think um, it's the money that Raymond's talking about, the, the, the unregulated money and the big chunks and the PACs and that sort of thing. And uh, uh, Howard Dean did a good job of, of raising small, small money donors. Bernie Sanders has gone crazy doing it. Uh, Barack Obama. Right. I mean, Barack Obama, when, when he was elected president, said that the Democratic National Committee Alone, not just his own campaign, but the DNC itself, we, we would take any uh, PAC money at all from uh, any of the unions, any of the, the progressive organizations, zip uh, when, when they there as long as he's president. I mean, he was very, very serious about this, but with the Citizens United, what we can, so that's very nice, but without being able to really talk about the 800 pound world, we'll see how Bernie Sanders does, because he's refusing any PAC money. And, uh, He's doing very well. There's a, another, uh, it's not social media, but it's internet that, that uh, it's very easy to contribute uh, small amounts of money uh, for Democrats uh, for something called Act Blue. And once you get in. Too easy. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You, know, you get these emails and you get them from everybody. I'm going to get them from Kansas and Minnesota and from people who are running for office. But it, it's set up so you can just click. You know, once you've read your name of your credit card, you just click donate. And that, I've done that. Yeah, you know, I'll do it yeah. at night. You know, three dollars, no, two more, click it, you know, or ten or a hundred. You know, it's it's dangerous. It's very different. That you have a follow up if you want. I wonder, you know, can you name a candidate, you know, that has been defeated because of this? This money that you're fearful of, and we're talking about President Obama here in New Hampshire. It, you think it's getting to where if you had enough money to advertise, you could sort of wash over all this sort of personal contact that you're also fond of here in New Hampshire. You all demand and see these people and get a chance to hear them. Uh, are you really fearful that uh, enough money and enough bumper stickers will obviate? the utility of the contact by these candidates with people in the country. I think we're fearful of that. 
Uh, and oh, I know. Okay, and if, if you people. hear uh, Joe McRae was talking about that his his fear is that the uh, national media is now becoming the of Iowa by deciding who gets to go on a primary uh, on, the, on the debate. You know, and I, when they first said they were going to use the national polls instead of I could never understand that. I don't understand why the national media say, okay, it should be the Iowa polls for the Iowa debate, the Hampshire polls, uh, polls for the New Hampshire debate, South Carolina, South Carolina, Nevada for Nevada, because there that would give the, the the person a chance to be on that stage. And, and uh, now, granted, it's historic. They've got the, it's still 14 candidates that are all, you know, would in a normal year be considered serious. Um, so it's it's harder uh, for them to decide that, but uh, the fact that Jim Webb and uh, uh, and Lincoln Chafee got out before Iowa even voted, um, I, I was chagrined at that. But, and one of the things that I used to uh, I beg the candidates in '08, don't get out. And New, New Hampshire, New Hampshire was only four days, five days after Iowa in '08, and so I told them, it's like no matter what happens, I would just still stay. Come to the, be part of the debate, be part of that, and, and we saw a number of them drop out before uh, they made it. And Dodd dropped out. I, I think money is, is, is a huge issue, and, and you know I can't right off the top of my head think of you know the the example that you, you just you just mentioned um, of, of something just overwhelming. However, what we have seen is evidence that money perpetuates campaigns that otherwise should have gone away simply because of no support. Um, witnessed the last time around when um, um, Cambridge, um, Santorum, you know, other folks who were picked up by one individual, Sheldon Nathan, Nathan right, was I mean, Gingrich's sort of sugar daddy and, and kept it sustained. So you sustain a campaign that you know, takes up heat and light, even though at the end of the day, it would have evaporated under normal circumstances were it not for anonymous big years. I think the other thing that we have to look at, and I'll be crass about it, I think we've got one party, in this case it's the Republican Party, that sees the demographics of this country moving in a direction that aren't good for them. And so they're taking an approach in which the combination of gerrymandering districts combined with changing voter laws and registration to make it more difficult for certain individuals and the influx of money for special interests incognito. I, th I think uh, you know, one of the things we could do is just shine a light so that people know where all this money comes from. But the whole notion is to say, you know, this democracy thing really isn't working for our party because we don't have the ideas that can win it over. But if we can gerrymander districts, if we can make sure that certain populations like students and low-income people and African Americans and folks who are Hispanics don't vote, and if we can get some sugar daddies going on, we can change the arc here, as opposed to taking a serious look at what we're doing and saying, how is it that the grand old party can be as grand as I think it has been in the past? Because I think they they have a different philosophy, very obviously, than, than the Democrats. But they've had a different philosophy with ideas to back it up in the past. And you had people like Nelson Rockefeller, and you had people here in the state like Warren Rudman that you may agree or disagree, but no one could argue that he wasn't a thoughtful, fine senator who might not have voted the way I wanted to all the time, but you had real respect for him. And those kinds of folks are few and far between. And you, you look at the cast of characters, and I say, oh my gosh, so Ben Carson and Donald Trump fade away. And who's the person that's rising? Ted Cruz, who is hated right. by everybody he works with. And I, I, I'm just saying to myself, you know, if, if, if you really cared about the democracy in the country, wouldn't you be thinking hard about how you could do things to gain an end that would be good for the country as, about, as opposed to just do things that would make sure that you could stop the other person from doing anything and somehow, you know, sort of take care of yourself? 
that's, can, that's can give you a combination. quick, quick example. And um, it's a little more complicated of an answer in the sense that what happened in the legislative races of, in Vermont in 2014, where um, there are certain districts in legislative districts in Vermont where the incumbents have been just routinely um, reelected. Can you fault any incumbent for not working hard? Whether they have a real challenge or not, yes. So I don't give them that excuse. But what happened is, is that because the Koch brothers come in with, the, with their Americans for Prosperity, uh, that's not actually a pack, And so they don't report how much money they've got or what they're going to be spending it on. And so all this group, I, I can't remember if it was six to eight or something, they were specifically targeted uh, legislators for whatever their community chairmanships were in, in the Vermont legislature in the last cycle. Uh, all of a sudden, had um, you know six, seven, eight, nine pieces of mail just eviscerating them, uh, sent to the districts, and they lost. Uh, and now it was a difficult year for Democrats. They, they you know they, they were surprised. The party wasn't prepared. Their caucus wasn't prepared because none of them saw none of them saw it coming. Uh, but it was these out-of-state corporate interests that came in and specifically took out uh, a, a number of the I think the big money comes later, but you know, very much is if, if 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 there's going to be any whittling on the number of people in a debate, it should be on, on the state that's holding the debate or some order, because there's all this fascination with these nationwide polls, which is barely it's mostly name recognition. It's got nothing to do with uh, you know ideas or issues or, or crazy ideas, myths, their ideas. And uh, if you combine that, we'll also you could get more at the front end of the of the face to face stuff. The, 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 the there are polls in the seventy five, seventy six that uh, I never would have worked so hard for Jimmy Carter because I would have given up uh, because he was never higher than one, two, or three percent ever, even in New Hampshire until the closing uh, month or so. Uh, and now. The poor young people that are involved in some of these campaigns, um, I, I think Gary Hart, you know, is an example of that. It was really kind of the last real shocker that was able to just kind of pull up because the the workers were just so committed, and there wasn't all this uh, intricate polling that was going on. But there's a poll a day uh, that's happening here, and it's really hard to kind of keep that out of out of the, the staffers head or the volunteers' head and get them just to focus on look at we work really hard, we get out the vote, we're gonna win. No matter what the poll says. And then you go to the cable 24 minute and they play it over and over again. You know. Yeah, it's, it's really an echo chamber. I mean, back in 92 in that race, New Hampshire played an absolute critical role because of the fact that Tom Martin, who was a tremendous popular senator from Iowa, was running for president. He got 76% of the vote in Iowa. Bill Clinton got 2.4% of the vote in Iowa, and then he got. 25 percent. He came here. Um, he was running against a next door favorite son, Paul Sargis. Uh, Sargis got about 30 to 38 percent. He was able to eat clean. He was able to play. I'm a company kid. I did a good job. Some tough stuff that happened in the media to him. He's from Iowa and New Hampshire. That's when he gave his famous speech over in Dover. He developed me on the at our first forum, Joe Graham has an accepted credit for coming up with the uh, go down and, and say that uh, he's the comeback kid. So that wasn't the first time he's accepted credit. With full modesty. With full modesty, and just in case you were about to tell you that somebody else, because about a dozen people also take credit for that, just yeah. want to let you know that we already know that it was Joe Graham's. Brilliant says, thousand followers. Well, it's just about uh, a little after seven. Well, we, we have one more question. Great. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> on uh, when we were talking about campaign finance, uh, people who have looked at it have said that uh, unions are actually one of the biggest uh, contributors to campaigns, and they obviously skew heavily Democrat. Is that a problem too, or is it only corporations that are a problem when they're giving? It, it, it is. Why? <laughs> I think they've been dwarfed by, well, by the corporations. The, the problem is, is the corporate dollars are secret dollars. So when you say uh, try to counter, you know, if, if you're comparing 
we don't really know what's being spent by Parker Road for the Citizens United decision allowed all of that money to be over there without any reporting uh, at all. Uh, certainly in New Hampshire, uh, I, I can't speak for what goes on anywhere else, but in New Hampshire, uh, labor money is not a defining for any campaign, whether it's a legislative campaign, campaign for governor, or senate, or anything like that. We don't permit actual uh, union dues to be used politically. It has to be part of their tax. It is very limiting uh, in New Hampshire. Um, I, don't, I don't think, that, I'm not aware of a single time where uh, union uh, money in New Hampshire um, caused for somebody to be defeated or caused for somebody to be elected. I mean, they certainly are donors and they're part of but it's not an overwhelming amount of money compared to what you've got to understand that the Americans for Prosperity in New Hampshire has more people in the New Hampshire staff than the Republican City Party. Uh, and when you talk about special elections, they fall out. They tweet out pictures of their volunteers canvassing from their phone, but not the Republican City Party. But the Koch brothers secret operation here in, in New Hampshire. So that you don't see a union saying we're handling the get out the board operations from the National Democratic Party. You don't see a union saying that we're, you know, we've got all of these phone banks going on. Um, it, it, it's really apples and, and it's apples and, and uh, marbles. That's it. Well, thank you so much, uh, for thank you. Chairman Kenny and Chairman uh, Helms uh, for being part of part of our final forum here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Notes on.